If your prints fall over or curl or warp or don't stick well, this video will help you pretty much no matter what brand of printer you have, assuming it's a plastic filament printer. I'll try to make this video as short as possible, yet still have the critical information you need. I'll also explain why parts curl, but the solution is always to make it stick better. The four basic techniques are squish, rounded corners or brim, surface prep, and temperature. I'll also talk about why corners lift in the brim section and historical techniques such as capped on in the surface section and rafts in the temperature section. If you have a heated glass bed, call it squish, brim, glue, heat. Squish. This is the most important thing and the one thing that some printers make it difficult to control due to auto leveling. The harder you squish filament into your print surface, the better it sticks. For example, on a glass bed, if you squish it hard enough to be transparent, it will stick so well you will occasionally remove tiny chunks of glass when you remove your print. So first, I'll show you what to look for on the bottom layer of your print. Here are some examples of an initial skirt. I stole some of these images from the internet, so I'm going to assume the bottom layer height is 0.3 millimeters. But if the nozzle prints 0.3 millimeters from the bed, you won't get good squish. The numbers in this image are guesses, assuming the slicer is printing a 0.3 millimeter bottom layer. Looking at the yellow brim, parts of it are too thin. I mean, you can do this if you really want it to stick badly, but you'll have trouble getting the part off the bed. If you use blue tape like in the photo, don't even try to get the tape off the bottom of the part. Just soak the bottom of the part in a plate of rubbing alcohol for a minute or so, then it'll come off easy. Anyway, the blue brim looks quite good, much better. I estimate it to be about 0.15 millimeters, so about halfway squished in, as opposed to nominal, which would be 0.3 millimeters. The red skirt is under extruded at the top left, but that's just normal initial under extrusion while priming. But the rest of it looks pretty good. This is how you want it, squished flat, a bit like a pancake, not ropey like a string. The black filament was printed much too high off the bed. Not only is it not squished, it looks ropey, like a string, but also it barely stuck at all and came off the bed. That's why it's all crooked. No lines are straight. Look at that infill. And there are gaps between the infill, huge gaps, because the nozzle was too high off the print bed. So how do you squish more? Well, if you have manual leveling, just move the bed closer to the nozzle. On printers that won't let you turn off auto leveling, you can have the slicer over extrude the bottom layer by 200%. I'm sure Simplify 3D can do this, or you could write a Cura plugin, or just add an M221 S200 for 200, 200 for 200%. Add that G code before the first layer starts, and do an M221 S100 for 100%, or back to normal after the first layer is done, which is what some printers call flow. So the Ultimaker calls this flow. You could also manually on the Ultimaker turn up the flow to 200% while you're printing the first layer, but on the Ultimaker you don't have to do that because you can do manual leveling. Hopefully you don't have a closed printer that doesn't accept G-code files, but if you do, I recommend you sell your printer on eBay immediately and buy an Ultimaker. If cost is an issue, get a used one as repairing one is well documented. Also, I suppose you could literally push the bed into the nozzle while it's printing the bottom layer if you have a printer that doesn't let you modify flow or bed height. On Ultimaker 2, just turn the three screws equal amounts by hand. You don't need to redo the leveling procedure. So here I am turning the three screws about equal amounts counterclockwise, about a sixth of a turn, but I do it twice, so it's about a third of a turn or 0.16 millimeters for the Ultimaker 2. Um, I also push up and down on the bed. It's I don't normally do that, but it's good to see what happens uh, if you've never tried it before. You should do this on every print. You should adjust these three screws a little bit. Um, and then here I'm undoing a little bit of what I did. Note that there's a downside to too much squish. The bottom layer will stick out slightly, kind of like brim. Maybe you don't want that. For example, if there's a hole in the bottom, you may need to file it out a bit. Kind of a pain, but maybe it's worth it. But sometimes I level normal. For example, for this bearing, if you squish too much, the gears are locked into place. So whenever I print these bearings, I have to turn the three leveling screws the other way to get the bed farther from the printer. When I print this bearing, I usually have to adjust the three screws several times, printing the bottom layer a few times before I get it right and make sure that none of the screws are touching each other. The next time you print something, push the bed towards the nozzle for a second such that you get some transparent filament. And after the print is done, note how hard it is to scrape that bit of skirt up. Imagine if the whole print was that hard to, to pull off the bed. That's the power of squish. Now I'll show you how I level the Ultimaker 2 and 3. If you don't have one of these printers, skips to part two. So this procedure works identically for the Ultimaker 2 or 3 or the 2 plus. Um, 
I don't... The, the This one millimeter step here isn't really needed. Um, it's only needed if you take your bed completely apart, like if you remove the screws or something like that. You're completely taking it apart. So I just kind of fly through this part. Um, now this part, it says slide a piece of paper between the nozzle and the glass. I don't do that. This is where I differ because I want it to squish better, so I actually haven't touched the glass. Um, normally this goes much quicker, but normally I don't have to focus and aim a camera, and normally the camera isn't in my way so I can see better. Uh, but the idea is you rotate until it just touches the glass, so one click away. So I turn the knob away one click, and it's away from the glass, towards the glass one click, and it goes towards the glass, but it won't go any farther, and then I push it. Uh, for the front corners, I have a different procedure. I tap from below and listen for a thunking sound. If I don't hear it, I know it's touching. Nothing. So I move it away, and now you hear the, the click. I move it back closer, I move it away, move it back. And notice how the last turn was only like a tenth of a turn of that knob. And because the threading is about 0.5 millimeters, that's p or exactly 0.5 millimeters, I believe, that's 0.05 millimeters of accuracy. And that's it. Rounded corners and brim. First, it's best to explain how shrinkage causes lifting corners. The green thing here represents your print bed as viewed from the side. The purplish-blue rectangle represents your unfinished print after about one centimeter has been printed. Now, as the upper layers are cooling, they shrink and pull inward. This twists the outer corners because the portion touching the bed is held in place, and this twisting force tries to pull the outer corners off the print bed. If the end of your part is not rounded, most of the force is at the very tip of the corners. But if you can round these corners, the force is spread out more. If you can't round the corners, then you can just use the brim feature. In fact, the brim feature probably holds your part onto the bed better anyway than rounding the corners of the part. It keeps air from getting under the part in the first place. So if you do brim correctly, you have kind of a suction force holding down your part. Also, I've read that you can put lots of large vertical holes in the part, or print with no bottom and little infill. Because the upper layers can't pull inward with as much force, but I'm skeptical this helps much, and I've never found it to be necessary, so just use brim and you'll be fine. Surface preparation. If you don't have a heated bed, skip to the blue tape section. If you have a heated bed with glass, it's usually fine without any glue, but adding a very thin layer of glue makes a big difference. I did an experiment where I measured the force to remove a part from glass at varying temperatures and with and without glue, and the glue required twice the force to get the part off the bed. Details of my experiment are in the description below. If you remove the glass bed, make sure you use a tool to open these clips. I've gotten cut on these clips before. Um, and when you tilt the glass up, don't tilt it up more than I did, or the clips in the back can get permanently bent. I guess you could bend them back down. Um, I like to wash the glass bed uh, at least once a month. Um, it's most, mostly what's on there is some old PVA, which I'll show you how to apply some new PVA. Um, but also this fingerprint grease and you know grease from your fingers and, and dust can accumulate. If you look at it carefully, you'll see like a thin layer of dust on there. Um, that's going to reduce how well it sticks. You can see I missed a spot in the upper right corner, but that's just PVA that I missed. Um, I like to use glass cleaner. This is just standard glass cleaner. So here's your basic glue stick. It's a PVA glue. Um, you don't need to put much on there. You can see that there's probably some glass that didn't get any glue on it, especially on the edges. So you wet a tissue and then you spread it around. It doesn't take much. You're gonna, you know, some of the glue will end up on the tissue, which is great because you need a very, very thin coat. And then you heat up the bed to 60, and it'll dry out by the time it gets to 60. Um, Hairspray is another PVA glue, but don't use it in the printer like this. You want to do it in the sink like this. Um, I use unscented. It's the blue Aquanet. It's a great PVA glue to use. Um, you'll see when you spray it on, it's kind of got a, it looks wet. You see it looks kind of wet. And then the same thing, you heat it up and dry it out. Um, or you can find a paintbrush that fits into uh, some kind of jar. Um, 
and use wood glue, a third type of PVA glue. Um, this is Elmer's wood glue, but any wood glue is fine. You want to do about one part wood glue and ten parts water. So I'm going to add, try to add about ten times as much water as there is glue. I mean, this is a very inexact. You could probably do twenty or fifty times as much water and it'll work just fine. So you apply it with a paintbrush. When you're done, of course, you want to rinse the paintbrush dry, uh, get rid of most of the PVA glue. So I'm just spreading it around here. You want it pretty thin. I, I kind of messed up in the far left corner, a little too thick, and so it won't dry out as fast as the rest. But here I am. I'm heating up the bed now. You can see it's at 25 Celsius, but I set it to 60. Um, we're going to watch this at 10x. Nothing much happens until it gets to around 45 Celsius. 38, 39, 40. Four, forty-five. Now it's really starting to pick up, dry out. You can see it drying out. Fifty-two Celsius. Fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven. Blue tape. So wider tape is better, um, but the most important thing is to clean it with rubbing alcohol. So rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol is found near where you find bandages. Um, you need it. There's like a waxy substance on the blue tape, and you need to clean that off. It only takes a few seconds, so you just put a little on a tissue, and you just wipe it for a few seconds, and you're good to go. And that will make a huge difference to how well parts stick to the tape. Now the problem is, will the tape stick to the glass? So you can see if you've got a wider tape, this octopus arm is going to have a harder time lifting the tape off the glass. Heat can help. If you have a heated bed, that can help. Although if you, although if you have a heated bed, why are you using blue tape? Um, but you need to heat it up quite a bit, like 40 Celsius. So it's a lot of blow drying, and you might want to just skip that. It's not necessary. Temperature. I did lots of experiments with temperature, and for PLA, as you try different bed temperatures, there is a rather sudden increase in how well a part sticks to the bed if it is above 45 Celsius. So never go below 45 Celsius with PLA, unless of course you use blue tape. I suspect this is because the PLA has more time to spread out better on the bed before solidifying, as obviously it's going to cool faster with a colder bed. However, it's much more complicated than that. The ideal temperature on an Ultimaker is about 60 Celsius, which is above the glass temperature of PLA, or the softening temperature. For ABS, you want 100 to 110 Celsius. Being above the glass temperature makes a huge difference because now when the upper layers are contracting, the bottom few layers are above the softening temperature and they can warp a little bit. You may think that's bad, you may think warping is bad, as we don't want our part to warp, but I'm talking about an insignificant amount of warpage, much less than 0.1%. But it's enough to relieve the very strong stresses occurring where the part touches the heated bed. Similarly, for other materials, being above the glass temperature or softening temperature relieves much of that stress. For very soft materials like Ninja Flex or nylon, flexible materials, it's not a problem. So you don't need to go over this, this softening temperature. Going to 70 Celsius makes an even, even bigger difference, but now you have other problems with PLA, as you can see in this photo of a part printed with the bed too hot. But if you are really desperate and are willing to live with that shrinkage, then go for 70 to 75 Celsius. So that's all you need to know, but I want to touch on a few historical techniques. Lots of people use capped on tape or polyamide tape. This is a reasonable surface. I used that myself for a while years ago on an aluminum bed, a heated bed, but I love glass so much better. All of the same techniques mentioned above apply. Regarding rafts, this is an older technology. It has a lot of flex such that the part can warp and the flexible raft takes up the slack, kind of like when the bottom, when the glass is above the glass temperature. But the raft still holds the part mostly in place. If you are really desperate, you can try a raft. You want the raft sparse enough and tall enough such that, that it can flex a bit. But the taller it is, of course, the more filament and time wasted. Rafts are particularly useful when done with a support material, and so this technology may return again. Most people hate rafts because they make the bottom of your part quite ugly, and you have to spend time removing them, and they waste time and material printing. But years ago, when we only had blue tape, 
and ABS, Raps was a lifesaver, I presume. I was lucky enough to start off with blue tape and PLA and never didn't have to deal with ABS for quite a while, back in 2013. As a hobby, I own a store that sells nozzles for most 3D printers and I sell other parts for Ultimaker printers. There's a link to it down in the description below, the gr5store.com. Thanks for watching and give me a like, but only if you think this video might help other people.